All right, thank you for that message and song. I'd like to invite your attention to Genesis chapter 35 uh, this morning. Genesis chapter 35. And uh, we're going to begin, we're going to continue on. This is a second out of three messages uh, on this subject of getting back to Bethel. And while you're finding your places in your Bibles today, you know, the Lord, uh, He doesn't only want a Sunday, Wednesday relationship with us. Uh, He doesn't only want us to talk to him, to see him, to uh, hear from him on Sunday or Wednesday. But listen, God is desperately chasing after us. God doesn't want weekend visitations with his children. Uh, God wants to have every bit of us. He wants to have all of us. He wants us to lay our all on the altar. And last week we talked about just in verse 1, and we went to Revelation chapter 2, Uh, But we talked about getting back to Bethel Bethel, and the call that Jacob heard, the call that Jacob responded to. Uh, And last week we talked about Bethel being that place where Jacob first met God where he first experienced God. And God says, I want you to come back home. I want you to come back to that place where I first met you. That's the call that he received last week. And so today we're going to look at the way that Jacob responded the way that Jacob responded, because listen, God is calling us back to that place where we first met him. God is calling us back to that fire that we had when we first met him. And so today we're going to look and see, uh, and the way Jacob responded is how we should respond. But let's, let's begin in verse 1. I want to ask you to stand uh, as we read our text this morning, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 1. The Bible says, And God said unto Jacob, Arise, Go up to Bethel and dwell there, and make there an altar unto God that appeared unto thee when thou fleddest from the face of Esau thy brother. Then Jacob said unto his household, and to all that were with him, put away the strange gods that are among you, and be clean, and change your garments. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God who answered me in the day of my distress and was with me in the way which I went. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. And they journeyed And the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Let us bow together and pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that your word would do everything you intend for it to do today. I ask for power. I ask for your presence in this service. And just just help me to do today what you've called me to do. It's in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. If you look again in verse 5, uh, after God has called Jacob and his family back to Bethel, we see in verse 5, and they journeyed. It was a, it was a journey for Jacob to get back to Bethel. It was, uh, it was pro- probably scary. Uh, There were enemies that he had made uh, getting out of the will of God and getting away from God. And now, in order to get back to where God met him and where he needs to be, where God is calling him, he's got to go right through those enemies that he's already stirred up. He's got got to travel. But I want you to understand, look in verse 5 again, uh, and they journey. Listen, we must move if we're going to get back to Bethel. We must change. We, getting back to Bethel involves change, and change is something we just don't care for as human beings. We like our same route, uh, we like our same routine, uh, and if you change any of that up, man, we go into hyper uh, panic mode. But listen, what God is saying is you've got to get up and you've got to move if you're going to get back where you need to be with me. You've got to journey, you've got to, uh, you've got to change, and getting back to Bethel, it involves us changing. It's going to take change. And here's the truth of it, we can't continue to do the same old things that we've been doing and have genuine revival. When we get in our ruts and we get away from God and we lose that fire that we've had, if we continue to do the same things that we've been doing, we can never, ever, ever have revival apart from us changing. 
We've got to change. We can't stay where we are and experience God. We must move. You know what the definition of insanity is, don't you? Doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. If we do the same things, we'll get the same results. And so he's calling us some things that must change in our lives. Listen, today there are some things that need to be removed from our lives if we're going to get back to where God wants us to be. There are some things that we need to lay down. There are some, there are some things that we need to set aside and bury those things because they're getting in the way of us getting where God wants us to get. They're getting in the way of us getting back to our Bethel. And so there must be a removal. There must be some renewal of commitments that we have made. And by the way, God isn't the one that needs to change. We are the ones that have moved from God, and we are the ones that need to change. Notice Jacob led his family to make some changes before they began their journey back to Bethel. And we're going to look at some of those changes that Jacob made, and he led his family to make. Jacob is the, the he's taking the leadership role in the family. Notice that, okay? Fellas, notice that. Jacob is taking the leadership role in the family. And I'm telling you what, we need, what our churches need more today than anything are men that will get on fire for God, that will be in love with God, that will passionately seek God above anything else in life, will put everything else to the wayside and put God first. Our families need a man like that in them. When will our families get right? When our daddies get right with God. We, we, we are the leaders of our family. It isn't our wife's responsibility to ensure that the family makes it to the house of God for worship. Thank God we've got some mamas that'll do that, but that's, that's, that's our responsibility as, as the man. It's our responsibility. It is our job to make sure that our homes operate according to the standards of God's word. And listen, here's the truth of the matter. We're going to give an account before God on how we treated these things. We're going to give an account before God on how we led our family, whether we led them in the ways of God or we led them away from God. So I want you to notice a few things with me this morning. Notice, first of all, they cast off their idols. What we serve and what we worship must change if we're going to get back to Bethel. They cast off their idols. And notice the responsibility, first of all, here in the family. In verse, in verse 2, Then Jacob said unto his household and to all that were with him, Again, Jacob took the leadership and his family got right with God after he got right with God. He took the leadership role. I, I saw this statistic, uh, and I want to share it with you. If a child leads the way in commitment to the church, or, or to church and the things of God, do you know how, uh, it's 3.5% of the family will follow if the child leads the way. If mama leads the way to commitment to church and the things of God, 17% of the family will follow. Fellas, if dad leads the way uh, in commitment to church, 93% of the family will follow. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? I mean, that's kind of mind-blowing, isn't it? Not really, because God has placed us there, and it's our responsibility. It's our responsibility to make sure that the important things are the important things in our family. And so however we lead, our family usually follows. And I want to encourage you today, rise up and be a real man. People say, well, a real man uh, is one that can lift a lot of weight. A real man is, is one that can get in the ring and, and go to town. Listen, a real man is a man that loves Jesus with all of his heart and leads his family in the ways of God. That's a real man. And when we get in eternity, it ain't going to matter how much weight you could pick up. It's going to matter how you led your family in the ways of God. That's what's going to matter. Listen, there's a lot at stake here. 
There, there's really eternity is on the line uh, in our families. However we lead, our family usually follows. If we resist the things of God and the will of God in our life, don't be surprised when our children resist the things of God in their life. This stuff about do as I say, not as I do, uh, that went out the window a long time ago. In fact, the business, that used to be popular, but that's never been true. <laughs> If we, as, if we as parents, especially daddies, if we run from God and we put God on the back burner, don't be surprised that when our kids grow up, they run from God and they put God on the back burner. And listen, here's the thing about it. You may be saved. You may have a relationship with God, but what about your children? What about them? What about, what about serving God? Because there's more to salvation than just getting out of hell. Now notice, notice the reading of idols in verse 2. Jacob said, put away the strange gods that are among you, the idols that are among you. And the word idol is something that, it, it, you, we can define it like this, it is something more important to us than God is. Anybody got any of those today? Rachel had stolen images she took from her father Laban back in Genesis chapter 31. He chases them down. He searches through all the tent, but she stole uh, uh, graven images from her father. And notice Jacob is saying here, our idols must go. In the book of 1 John uh, chapter 5 and verse 21, notice what John says. Little children, keep yourselves from idols Amen. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 15. John says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And so our idols must go. And I know what some of you must be thinking this morning. Well, preacher, you know, I have no, I've got no statues at my house. I don't have a graven image. There's not a, there's not a big image of gold that I bow down to and I worship. I'm here today, uh, and I'm just doing just all right. I'm doing fine. I, I don't have a little Buddha uh, in my closet or in my living room. I, I mean, I don't have any of those types of things. I'm, I'm doing good in this department, so I like this part of the sermon. Keep it up. Listen, here's the truth. All the things that steal the love and devotion that we should have to the Lord must be removed from our lives if we want his blessings on our lives. We cannot serve a false god, a false idol in our life, and then in turn be upset when God doesn't show us his favor and bless us like he intends to. Bless us like he wants to. And so listen, some things that could be idols in our lives this morning, it may be money that might be your idol. And what's keeping you from surrendering your all to God is your love of money and your need of money and your chasing after money. It may be, uh, it, it, it may be a position that we want or, uh, or, or some prestige that we want. It may be our possessions that are keeping us from God. It may be our television that's keeping us from where God wants us to be. Just something that simple. But it's occupying all of the time that we need to be spending with God. It may be, uh, it, it may be sports. And I think I said this last week. Listen, teach your kid how to hit the ball. Teach them, how, teach them how to throw the baseball, the softball. But listen, don't put that in front of their relationship with God. Go fish. Man, I love it. But listen, it doesn't need to take place of God in my life. I don't need to put that first. And so God is saying, put me, come back to where I am first. Colossians chapter 3. And verse 1 and 2, notice what the scripture says there. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1, the Bible says, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. He says, if you, you know, I look around and I say, I'm not even dead yet, Brother Paul. 
And you're telling me about being risen with Christ. Listen, it's just that sure for the child of God. He says, seek the right things. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. What does that mean? That means seek the right things because Jesus is at the right hand of the Father today. That means he has right, he has power, he has authority, he has all of those things. He is sitting on the throne in heaven, but he wants to be on the throne of our hearts. And so he says, seek those things, uh, seek the right things. Notice in verse 2, he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. The word set, it means to fix our mind on heavenly things, to desire passionately, to chase after the godly things. Now, whatever takes my time, my money, my devotion, that's my God. Whatever's got the most of me, that's my God. Whatever takes all of my attention, that's my God. And Almighty God wants to have a, he wants to have preeminence in our lives. He wants to have priority in our lives. He, what God is saying is put me first. Put me first. On Sunday, God's saying put me first. You got all the rest of the week and God says put me first. On Wednesday, God says, put me first. But listen, way more than that, on Monday and Tuesday and Thursday and Friday, God says, put me first. God wants to have this awesome relationship with us. He wants to fellowship with us. But listen, our idols have to go. Our idols must go. Notice in verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings, which were in their ears. Now what about this, these earrings? I understand all the strange gods, but he says also all those earrings that were in their ears. There's nothing wrong with an earring uh, in their ear. Uh, I, don't know if, I don't know if this had to do with some type of idol worship that was going on at that time, or if they just were wise enough to understand, you know what, this might turn into a problem. This might get in the way of me and God. And listen, if anything, if there's, if there's even a temptation, even of good things, uh, not necessarily sinful things, that might turn into a problem, we need to flee those things and cast those away also. Jacob and his family said, look, if it's even a, if it can become a distraction for me, I'm going to bury it in, uh, under the tree in Shechem because I want to chase after God. <clears throat> Notice secondly in this text, they cleaned up. They cleaned up. And having been at camp with 30 boys all week, cleaning up's a good idea. Notice they cleaned up. In verse number two, notice the demand to clean up. Jacob says, put away the strange gods that are among you. And then he says, be what? Clean. He says, you got to clean up. I want you to be clean. The Bible teaches us that we ought to, we ought to abstain from the very appearance of evil. That's what the New Testament teaches us. And so clean up. What he's talking about is all filthiness. Inward and outward had to be cleansed. He's not just talking about them taking a shower or a bath. He's talking about filthiness. Now, outward filthiness, that's easy to spot, isn't it? Oh, yeah, we can catch that one real fast. You know why? Because your sin is different than mine and yours is visible. So I can see and I can spot your outward sin. Outward sins such as uh, be, be drinking and partying and, uh, and, and, uh, and sinful things. Notice inward sin also, though. Those are not so easy to spot. Inward sin is those thoughts that we have, the, the attitude that we have. Inward sin is our pride. And listen, we need to clean up today if we're going to get back to Bethel. If we're going to get back to where God wants us to do to be, we must clean up the outside and the inside. Everything must be cleaned up. Sin must go. Our pride must go. Our unforgiveness must go. Those bad attitudes, those wrong attitudes must go if we're going to get back to where God wants us to be. We've got to be clean. 
Notice the danger of a dirty life. Psalm 66 and verse 18. Notice what it says there. Psalm 66 and verse 18. It says, if I regard iniquity, where at? In my heart. If only God just saw what we could see, right? We might be okay. But God can see way deeper than that. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, notice this next part. The Lord will not hear me. That pretty serious? To put a to put a, a barrier between you calling and God hearing? That's pretty serious. So notice the danger of not cleaning up. Not getting to where God wants us to be. And then notice a clean life in Psalm 24, verse 3 and verse 4. Psalm 24, verse 3 and verse 4. He says there, who shall ascend into the holy hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor, nor sworn deceitfully. So he says, if you want to get to God, if you want God to hear you, if you want to fellowship with God, you've got to be clean. God expects his people to turn away from the wickedness of the flesh. I'm not going to turn over there, but in Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 through 11, we find uh, where, where Paul tells us that we need to mortify, put to death the deeds of the flesh, to take off those old fleshly garments and to put on these new garments in Christ Jesus. And so they cleaned up. They cast off their idols. They cleaned up. Notice thirdly, they changed clothes. They change their dress. They change their clothes. Notice in verse 2, he says, and change your garments. What does that even mean? Change your garments if we're going to get back to Bethel. Well, the garments symbolize this character. Garments, they symbolize character. And, and Jude, in verse 23, it says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment that is spotted by the flesh. The garment that is spotted by the flesh. The garment symbolizes our character. And what, what Jacob is saying, our garments are spotted by sin. Let me ask you today, how about you? How are your garments today? Are your garments spotted by sin? Do you need to get clean? Do you need to change those clothes? Change that character? Listen. The garment must be changed before we can get back to Bethel. Clean garments are symbolic of separation. If we're to be all that God wants us to be, where we need to be, God using us the way that God wants to use us, we've got to dress up. We've got to change our garments. What do you mean, preacher, I've got to dress up? You mean I've got to wear a suit now? That's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you, we need to be clothed in holiness of Almighty God. God said this, be ye holy as what? I am holy. If we, if we want God to use us in a great way, we've got to clean up and we've got to change our dress. We've got to change our clothes. We've got to dress up in holiness. If we want to be where God wants us to be, where we need to be, we have to change our clothes. If we're to represent a holy God, we must be adorned in holiness and God's called us to be his representatives in this world. This world and all the things that are embraced by it must be rejected by the child of God who wants to get close to the Lord. <clears throat> you believe that? Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. You'll hate the one and you'll love the other. You'll cling to one and you'll despise the other. We've got to love God more. Be careful of the things of the world that we embrace. Be careful to be modest at all times. Be careful of uh, the music that you allow into your ears. Why? Because it, it, it goes to your soul and it affects your thinking. 
Be careful what you let your eyes see. Be dressed in holiness. Set some standards. Say, I'm not, uh, that's not going to be for me. Be careful what we let come into our home. Jacob had to kind of clean house here, didn't he? He had to get rid of those things that were, uh, th that was bringing the family down. Mom and daddy, don't be scared. <laughs> don't, don't be scared to, to put some limits on that phone. Don't be scared to take that joker away. Listen, it's better if they don't like us for a little bit <laughs> than if Satan used that to grab them and to drag them away. Jacob, he cleaned the house. And then notice fourthly, they created some distance. They created some distance. Jacob said, we are going back to a place in verse 3. Notice it. And let us arise and go up to Bethel, and I will make there an altar unto God, who answered me in the day of my distress, and was with me in the way which I went. Now listen, he left God. God never left him. God never, ever left him. He was in the same place that God always was, and that's how it is this morning. God is where he's waiting where we left him. And so, so, so he says, we're going back to a place. We're going back to the will and the presence of God. And Jacob, I think, said this, no matter what the cost, we're going back to Bethel. No matter what it costs me, no matter the danger that it takes me, we're going to get back to where God wants us to be. I don't care if the world thinks we're silly. We're going to get back to where God wants us to be. Listen, we need to get there this morning. No matter the cost, no matter what happens, no matter the danger, no matter all of these things, we got to get back to where God wants us to be. Oh, that you would say today, mama, daddy, child, listen, if you would say today, we're getting back to Bethel, and I don't care what it costs us, we're getting back there. I don't care how far we have to travel, we're getting back there. I don't care what we have to bury, we're going to get back there. I don't care the danger that we have to go through, the hardship that we have to endure, we we're getting back to where God wants us to be. Rise up. Get right where God wants us to be. Notice, Jacob said we're going to bury some things. In verse 4. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand, and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shechem. He buried them. He buried them. He buried them to be gone forever. And, and this is really a picture of repentance. This is really a picture, and repentance can be defined like this, a change of mind that results in a change of direction. Listen, there may be some this morning that God is dealing with you. You need to lay some stuff down. You need to cast some stuff and you need to bury some stuff today in this altar. And you need to rise up and get back to where God wants you to be. There are some things this morning that maybe have a hold on us. They have too much of us. And God is crying out, come back to me and bury. We need to bury them in this altar this morning. And then we need to get up walking in victory. Get up being close to the Lord. Listen, what's hindering your walk today? Maybe a person. Maybe a thing, it's not worth hindering your walk with God. Bury it in the altar today. Put some distance between you and those things. They left them in Shechem. And then notice Jacob says, we're going back no matter what it cost us. No matter what, we're, we're going to go back to Bethel. Notice in verse 5, and they journeyed, and the terror of God was upon the cities that were round about them, and they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. So we know that, that they had gotten in some trouble in this area that they've got to cross back through. They have gone in and they have killed some people. They have upset some, uh, some towns and some families, and they have murdered some people. Jacob says, I don't care about that. We're going to get back to where God told us to get back to. 
And maybe one of the sons said, but daddy, we've killed some folks through there. I mean, that, that has made them our enemy now. And Jacob says, we're going to go back. We're going back. We're going to trust God. We're not going to worry about intimidation. Listen, when you decide, I'm going to get where God wants me to get, Satan and this world is going to give you every excuse why you shouldn't do that. He's going to give you every excuse why that will never work because you've messed up too bad now. The journey is too far to get back where God wants you to be. You have made some enemies. What are people going to think about you if you get back to where God wants you to be? Listen, the in, the, here's, the, here's the thing about it in verse 5 again. The terror of the God was upon the cities. And they did not pursue after the sons of Jacob. Why did they not pursue? God protected them as they went back to where he told them to get to. Listen, it can be scary for us to walk down an aisle and to lay our all on the altar and get where God wants us to get. That can be intimidating. That can be scary. There may be some of our friends, we've got, to, we've got to put that aside to get where God wants us to get. There may be some things that we've got to, we've got to let go if we're going to get back to where we're going to get. And they may not, listen, they're not going to like it when you get back to Bethel. But Jacob made up his mind, we're going to go in spite of anything. We're going to get back to where God wants us to be. Listen, God's got you. God's got you. If you'll follow what he says and get where he says, God will take care of you. Satan will try to stop you. The world, your friends may try to stop you. It's intimidating, but nothing can prevent the honest heart from getting right with God. And so let me ask you this morning, is the Lord speaking to your heart? Are there some things today that the Holy Spirit is touching those things and urging you and saying, you know what, that's been a problem. <laughs> that's been taking more of you than I've had, and that's what God the Spirit's telling us. You need to let that go. That's what God is leading us to do. Listen, would you be courageous enough Will you finally make up your mind and say, we're going, we're going back to Bethel no matter what? No matter what, bury some things. Have some burials in this altar. And then let me say this, okay? And I'm getting ready to close. It doesn't matter what we say. Talk is cheap. Every service that we have an invitation at Austin Chapel, we could find ourselves in the altar. But you know what? It doesn't matter. <laughs> this is not where the real test is. The real test is when we walk out those doors. The real test comes on Monday. The real test comes on Tuesday. So listen, God isn't just wanting to hear your words saying, God, I'm coming home. God wants to see you actually get where God wants you to be. <clears throat> As we get ready, let's have a song. As our musicians come. Listen, is God calling you back to Bethel? If he is, how will you respond? Man, God has got some great things waiting for us. And we remember when we first got saved, don't we? We remember how excited how great it was, how great the things of God were. But we have a tendency, it's easy to do, to get away from that feeling, to get away from that fire. Listen, God is calling us just like he called Jacob. Come back. Get back to Bethel. Get back close to me. And may we respond today the way Jacob responded. No matter what. We're getting where God wants us to get. Listen, if I was, well, I can't say that. I was going to say if I was a, if I was a daddy or if I was a parent, I am, I are one, as they say. You know what? I want my kids to get all of God that they possibly can. 
at the house, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Why? Because think about all the hours that the world has access to our children. God's saying, come on. Come on. Come on. And maybe you're here today and maybe you've never had a Bethel experience. Maybe you've never been saved. God is calling for you to come and to have a relationship with him once and for all through his son, Jesus Christ. Listen, we, we're not promised tomorrow. If God is dealing with you about salvation, why don't you come to Jesus Christ, accept him, put your faith and your trust in him, ask him to forgive you, and make him the Lord of your life. As we stand together this morning, and as we sing together, what...